Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, PPENV and in general about how we manage our Python dependencies across projects in the, industry, in the organization and how we keep our uh, environment synced with one another. A bit about myself. I've been working at Twiggle for the past year. I'm having a time of my life. Uh, really, I've worked with great people before, but Twiggle is by far the best team I've ever joined. Um, I've been using pa uh, Python for a few years now, uh, both for academia and industry. And uh, one of my passions is about connecting uh, data science and machine learning uh, models that uh, researchers build uh, into production and sort of bridging the gap between the data scientists and machine learning researchers and uh, developers. I'm a father of two as of last week. Uh, this is the... <laughs> so now they say you, one of, one of your, uh, um, the things you think about when you, when you have an extra child is whether they fit in the car. So, so they, um, this is the point where I realized there are two of them. And uh, I really have to pay, thank my wife for uh, allowing me to be here and uh, agreeing to be alone uh, for a few hours. Uh, so thank you, Tal, if you're watching this. Uh, so why are we here? Uh, why I came here? Uh, I'm here to talk about environment re reproducibility. Uh, and basically, if I write a piece of code, how do I make sure the, the code runs in the same way? and deterministically reproducible on a different machine, whether it's a remote machine for remote execution, on a production machine, or just a colleague of mine that wants to run my code and, and you know, go with it. And I'll talk about why it is important. I hope, I hope I'll be preaching the choir here, uh, and, uh, and a bit of tools that we can achieve it. People is just one of them. So a bit about the history of how we install packages in Python. Uh, so in the past, you had to find a package, download a tarball, and uh, run setup pi. I don't know how many, how many of you have had the chance to do that, like manually install packages. OK, quite a lot. Uh, so people used to, be, uh, used to do that. Uh, some people were lazy and just you know, copied the code to uh, site packages. How many of you have done that? OK. So later, uh, we were introduced to Easy Install, then, uh, which, which automatically found, downloaded, and installed uh, packages. There was no Easy Uninstall, so we were still in a biff, but uh, it was a, a progress. Uh, and ever since, the, the, the de facto standard right now is PIP. I guess everyone here uses it. Maybe some of you use Conda, but, but all of you must know PIP. Um, ISO 2011 is the de facto standard. We still have a problem where all of our programs, all of our applications, all of our um, <coughs> projects, they all use the same Python environment, which means they use the same packages. So for example, if, if I have one project where I need a, a different, a, a specific version of, uh, say, Pandas, if I want to connect it to the last lecture of Daniel, uh, then this will be the version that I use. And if, uh, if I use, if use it in a, different a, a different project and then I update the package, it might break the code on a different project if it relies on a specific version of pandas. So that's a problem. Um, to cope with it, uh, we use something called virtual environments. Uh, I guess some of you know. How many, how many of you don't know virtual environment, what a virtual environment is? Good. It's good I'm here. Um, so a virtual environment is basically a separate installation of Python. It's not really a separate installation, but logically it is. You have a different. You can use a specific uh, Python executable. You can ev even use uh, a different Python implementation. So, if you, for some, for those of you who know, uh, you can use either C Python or PyPy. You can have a virtual environment with PyPy and a different virtual environment with C Python. For those of you, of you it doesn't mean anything. Then it doesn't matter. But uh, you can use different Python versions. So, so you can have a virtual environment with Python 2.7. If you still use it, you should not. But if you do. Uh, and the specific environment for Python 3.6 or 7 or 8. Uh, and the more important thing, maybe, is that you have a spirit side, side packages uh, folder, which means you have a different space of packages installed on that virtual environment. So you can have a, a virtual environment with pandas uh, 0.24.2, which was the version that Daniel used in his lecture. And um, maybe you can have later a, a, an environment with pandas 0 0.23 for some reason. Setting it up is very easy. It's even easier with a tool called virtual env wrapper, but 
even with virtual environment, it's pretty straightforward. You choose the destination folder where you want to put your virtual environment in, uh, and then you just activate it. It even works on Windows. It's not very, it's not that straightforward for things to work on uh, Windows, but it does. Uh, so this is how you do it. Um, there's also Conda, which acts both as a package, man package manager and an environment manager. I guess most of you know it uh, here in the crowd. It's highly popular in the scientific community. I myself started um, I work with Python with Conda. It really saved my life. Back then it was really hard to install things and, and compile packages in Windows. Um, the problem, at least on my end, is with Conda is that it doesn't support all the packages that Pips does for some reason. I don't know exactly why, but some packages, if you want to install them using Conda, it won't work. You won't find them in the, in the Conda channels. Um, you can still use Pip inside a Conda environment, and it will still recognize this package inside the environment. But still, it would have been nicer for to use just one tool. So I myself switched to uh, pip with virtual uh, for my work. But you know, you can still use Conda and pip for the packages that do not exist. How many of you know Conda? Use Conda. So what do we have so far? A mess, uh, thanks to XKCD, of course. Uh, they, he, well, he basically has a, uh, a sketch for everything. <laughs> um, so um, I guess maybe some of your uh, environments uh, for people in the crowd look like this. Mine looks like this. Uh, I'm trying to keep it in order, but it's hard. Uh, so, but, but basically what people uh, do use right now is, uh, is really the standard is to use pip and supply requirements txt file with a project for people to use. Some people use different uh, requirements txt files. So you, have, you would have, for example, requirements txt for the regular environment. You would have requirements dash dev, requirements dash, I don't know, test for things that you want to install on your development machine or for testing, but you don't want for packages you don't need installed on a production system, for example. Uh, you can uh, specify uh, versions in the requirements txt file in, in several ways. Uh, so I guess most of you know uh, the, first, the first three, uh, the, the, sec the last ones are less common and it's a bit misleading. It took me a while to figure out what's going on there. Uh, so, for example, if you used uh, the one before the last, 1.2.1, uh, it would fix the minor version, 1.2, and it would ask for at least uh, uh, the one version in the micro. So, for example, 1.2.2 would satisfy this rule, but 1.2, uh, okay, 1.2.0 doesn't exist, but still, if it had, then it, uh, uh, would not have worked. Wait, wait, wait. 1.2.0 would not have satisfied this rule. How do we specify requirements? There are two approaches to it. For, uh, one is to say, what is my actual dependencies? I use pandas for my project. I would say, OK, I would put pandas in the requirements txt file. The other one says that for, for, for perfect reproducibility, I need to just say exactly what my environment holds, and then I use pip freeze for it. Pip freeze outputs everything that is installed, not just the things that I uh, directly installed, but also the dependencies of my installed packages. So, for example, here if I install pandas, uh, the real environment looks like this, which are pandas requirements. People uh, go between this and that. Uh, most people use this. This is perfectly rep reproducible. It has its problems, its caveats, but still, this is the more recommended way to go, but still, I would like to really specify this. Okay, I would like to specify what I'm using, and I don't really care about the sub dependencies. I mean, I should, but most of the time I don't. So uh, uh, to that end, we can use peep tools. It's been uh, out there for a while now. Uh, this is a picture from their homepage. Uh, it sort of explains uh, most of it. So what you would do here is do uh, define a requirements.in file, which is exactly like the one here. This is where I specify what I need. And then it's pip compile to generate a requirements.txt file, which holds everything that I should install. And this, uh, and this is the file 
well, I, I share these two files with my colleagues or with the production environment, but still, when, when I want to install and reproduce the environment that I used in my testing and testing my code, I use the requirements.txt file. The second question, apart from how do we specify the requirements, is uh, the dependencies, is how do we keep them up to date? Which is really, which is a real problem. I think most of you would agree. Uh, some problematic, problematic scenarios that may arise from, uh, uh, from lack of synchronization is the, the, the most obvious one is if I install a new package, I write a new piece of code, I use a new package, and I forgot to, to update the requirements.txt, naturally, for other people, it would not work. It would result in an import error. Um, if I install a package accidentally in my environment and then use pip freeze, it will also put that in requirements txt. And if I don't uh, keep, the, if I don't pay attention to it, it will just stay there because no one will touch it for a while. And, and by a while, I mean forever. Um, more examples: If we don't update the requirements for a specific package that we pinned. The version, we, if we ask for, for exact version, it would just stay there for, again, for a very long time until someone decides to update the package. And if there's no new um, functionality that we need in the package, we would not do that. And we might find ourselves carrying packages that are very old and might contain vulnerabilities. And this has happened in the past. It's not a theoretical issue. Uh, and if we don't specify an exact version, we can have something else going on where uh, people update their packages and a new version sort of introduces a breaking change. This, this happens most of the time when people change to major versions, but some packages, uh, and I won't specify names, <laughs> uh, introduce breaking changes in, uh, in micro version. It depends on the, uh, on the time that the package has been alive. So anyhow, to address this second problem, we can use the tool called pipenv, uh, which I've been using for a few months now, and I'm very happy with it. Uh, it's ideal for applications, not for uh, packages. But uh, what it does, it relies on two separate files. One of them is called the pip file, and the other is pipfile.lock. So the pip file is the one, is very sim it's very similar, the flow is very similar to the one we've seen with pip tools, where they use requirements in the requirements.txt as an output file. This is the same. The pip file acts like the requirements in. I put there the requirements that I really need, the packages that I directly use, and I can also specify their, their versions, but I don't, I don't have to. The pip file lock acts as a real requirements txt where you install directly from, and it, and it holds the exact version of things that you have, of packages that you have installed in your environment. If there are plans to, to, uh, for that to be supported by pip, you will be able to do, to do pip-p uh, pip file, and it will install everything, but it's really not clear when, and, and, and by now I'm not sure if it ever will be, but they still say they will support it. Um, I guess there are new ways to, uh, to manage it, but uh, still. So this is human readable, this is the pip file, it's really, it's really easy to, to uh, to manipulate if you want. But you don't have to because pipenv does that for you. Okay, pipenv is a combination, combination of virtual env and pip. Uh, and you can use it to uh, generate, both to create uh, virtual environments, install dependencies into your, install packages into your environment, and, and update the pip file and pip file log files all in one go. So if you do pip and, pip and install instead of pip install, it will install the package in your environment, and it will update the pip file, and also update the log file with all the dependencies inside. And the environment is associated with a directory, so if you have a directory for a project and you create an environment there, uh, it will be tied to your project, and everything you do with pip and inside that directory in its subdirectories, will, you will be working inside uh, your virtual environment, which is, which is tied to your directory, and you don't even know you don't even need to know where the virtual environment actually is. You can know it, but you don't have to. Uh, so I plan to do a little demo here, but I'm not using my laptop, so I don't want to take any chances. So I'll just, uh, we'll just look at a few examples of how uh, this goes and how easy it is. To set an environment, all you have to do is pipenv. You, you, you write pipenv, you can do 
pipm dash dash free or a specific version of Python if you want to use it. And it will use the, 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 the executable. If you have pyenv installed, if you know what that tool is, it will, and you don't have that specific version that you specified, it will ask you if you want to install it uh, directly using pyenv. If you don't have pyenv, then you will have to do it manually. This is how we install. As I said before, it will, again, it will automatically update the pip file, file and the pip file log file. What I didn't mention before is that if you uh, share your code with others or use a source control, you, will ha you have to commit both the pip file and the pip file log file. The pip file log file is used to regenerate the environment. It has all the instructions on how to, on what packages to use to create an environment that should run your code. So you should also share the pip file log file. You can do pip uh, and install dash dash dev if you want to separate your uh, packages to regular packages that you want on production and the ones you want on dev. So for example, if you want PyTest or Nose, whichever uh, testing package uh, framework you use, you can share it using this uh, dash dash dev. Um, Using pip and shell, running pip and shell inside your working directory is the same as activating the virtual environment. So if you do that, it spawns a shell uh, inside your current shell, it spawns a subshell, and everything you do uh, from then on until you hit exit uh, is run using the virtual environment. Does that make sense? Okay. If you use pip and run and then I use a command, it will run just this command using the virtual environment that you've created using pipenv, and uh, then after it's done, you will be back in your original prompt. Pipenv graph is very nice. Uh, I wish I could have demoed it to you, uh, but it just shows you the packages that you install and their dependencies. It just shows the graph, the dependency graph that it uses. It generates it anyway to create the log file, so it just outputs it in whatever format you want. It can output it, output it to just text or, or JSON. Um, that's about it. Um, there are also more uh, usages that you can uh, look it up in the um, manual. Uh, it has ID support in uh, PyCharm. I've been using it in PyCharm. It's pretty cool. Uh, it, it, PyCharm supports it supports it the, the same way it supports virtual ends. So you can just use it. And every time you install, uh, do you know the feature where you can just type in import package, and then if it doesn't exist, you can automatically install it. So if you use PyCharm with pipenv, it will automatically use pipenv for it. So, so you're all set up. You don't even need to. OK, so uh, the comment from the crowd is that so if, you have, if, you, if you create a new project and you have pipenv installed, it will automatically use a pipenv environment for your project. This, this will be this will be the default which is pretty cool. Uh, VS, Code also, VS Code also supports it. I haven't used it, but I found out that it does. Atom does not. It doesn't have a plugin for it yet. It has a plugin for virtual env, but not for pipenv. So maybe it will be in the um, future. Some downsides to using pipenv. Uh, it, it, it only supports applications. It's not good for packages or libraries. So if you're building a package or a library, uh, it's not recommended. It doesn't work well. Uh, we tried it before finding out that other people do not <laughs> do not do that. Uh, so you know, there are other tools right now that rely on a, a different specification, a, a PEP uh, 5.18, I think. Uh, uh, these tools are called uh, Hatch or Poetry. They're very good. Uh, I've just tried them in, a few, in the last few days uh, while preparing this lecture, and they look pretty amazing. Uh, I see nods like from the crowd uh, that uh, approve. So you can check them out, poetry or hatch. Uh, locking can be slow. It's not specific to pipenv, I think, because the, uh, resolving a dependency graph, if you have a lot of dependencies, can be um, lengthy, can, can take time, but it keeps improving. And again, this, this is only in your development um, uh, environment. If you run on production, things will go much faster because it, it installs all your packages concurrently because it knows in advance what it should, should uh, install and just runs everything in, uh, in concurrency. And uh, one thing that I found uh, a bit annoying is that it automatically updates all your dependencies every time you install a new one. So if, for example, I installed a specific version of uh, Pandas before and then I wanted to install uh, something else like uh, you know, Flask, 
uh, it will automatically update my pandas version even though I didn't ask it to. This would be the default. You can override it with a selective upgrade. But still, it's annoying that it's the default, although it makes sense. So to sum up the strong points of uh, pipenv, it installs packages and updates the log file one command. So you don't have to worry about syncing your actual environment with the requirements file that you specify. It keeps them up to date. Um, it prevents conflicts. Uh, it also supports reading for requirements.txt. So if you have an existing project and you set a pipenv environment, it will automatically use the requirements.txt file that you have, and you can go from there to uh, use your project. That's it. Thank you. Questions? So the question is about Docker. Uh, Docker, I have, to, I have to say that I haven't used it in a Docker environment, so I can't say anything about it. But I know that people have, but I can't say anything uh, for or against. So, uh, so if you heard, uh, in following up on the last example on Docker, so uh, the, the ppenv repository has an example for using it in Docker. So you can use that. Thanks.